So let me go ahead and begin now with just a couple of um, preliminary comments. My name is Holly Taylor Kuhlman. I'm coming to you from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I want to offer a welcome both on behalf of myself and on other members of the steering committee for the um, Society for Post Supersessionist Theology. New, a new society. Uh, we've only been in existence for a couple of years now. Um, I can say that certainly with the occurrence of today's meeting, we've seen a kind of exponential growth and in interest. Society was founded based on the assumption that there was um, an interesting, um, an interesting and in some sense growing interest in this way of doing theology. And I think our experience has borne that out thus far. Um, <clears throat> as you will um, already know, having registered, I'm very happy to say that the focus of our meeting today is a panel discussion of a recent book from Professor Gavin DaCosta, Catholic Doctrines on the Jewish People <clears throat> since Vatican II. Um, what I'm going to do is to take a brief moment, and I'll just say this at the outset, all of my uh, introductions and moderating comments will be brief and will be efficient. Um, my hope there is to um, allow as much time as we can for the content of the program itself. So with that in mind, let me introduce to you um, very briefly, Professor DaCosta himself, and I'm actually going to ask him to say um, a word about the book itself. Um, not not lengthy, but just framing the book and its arguments for us, um, knowing that not everyone who has connected and will have had a chance to read it yet. So Professor DaCosta is professor of Catholic theology at the University of Bristol in Great Britain. He is, I believe, still head of the theology and religious studies, and he has lectured at Bristol since 1993. Um, this most recent book that we'll discuss today comes after um, a long uh, period of study and inquiry into the question of Christianity, Catholicism, uh, specifically in many cases, and other religions. Um, with that, I will turn it over initially to Professor DaCosta. Please tell us a little bit more about this recent book. Thank you very much, Holly. Thank you, the panel and all who are attending. It's really fabulous to be here. Um, the book uh, came out of an, a previous book uh -huh. on Vatican II's teaching on the Jews and the Muslims. And I think most of you will have encountered the wonderful kind of shock of research, which suddenly makes you discover something that you didn't quite notice, even though you've been in the field for years and years, and you begin to be pretty embarrassed about that. Um, so I wrote a second book, which is this present book on teaching about the Jews after Vatican II. And the book has a basic plot that runs, uh, the first chapter establishes that the uh, magisterium, the Catholic teaching body, and for those who are kind of uh, from different traditions, when I use the word magisterium, it's simply saying certain authoritative people within our community who are unpacking and reflecting on revelation to the community and they have a special standing. So what's really exciting is that in 1964 and five, in trying to rebut the deicide charge against the Jewish people from our own Catholic tradition, there was a recovery of the Pauline teachings about the Jews as being recipients of God's gift, which is irrevocable, the gifts and the promises. Um, after the council, it took until 1980, in my view, although this is contested, to apply that actual insight to living day Judaism. The council sort of rather treated Jews like a museum piece, as one uh, put it, because it was talking about biblical Judaism, but John Paul II applied it to living rabbinic Judaism. And after him, that's been repeated by Pope Benedict and Francis. So once we have this position, we've got a really interesting question for Catholic theologians, Christian theologians as well, I hope. If the Jewish covenant 
is there, unrevoked, authentic, and irrevocable, what does it mean for Christian thinking? Chapter two looks at this in terms of the previous council teachings of Florence, which are classically used to show that the earlier church has rejected Judaism as a living religion. Now, this is a unique problem for Catholics. If the Pope and a council teach X, and later, 400 years later, they teach not X, we've got a real problem on our hands. The purpose then of this chapter, which is not supposed to be defensive, but argued in a historical manner, is that Florence and some of the negative teachings apparently from earlier councils were not quite as they have been interpreted. And from that basis, I want to kind of then move in a confident way, bringing the Catholic community to say, look, this is not going against previous teachings. In fact, the previous teachings give us grounds for looking more positively at the phenomena of both Judaism itself, as well as Jewish practices within Catholicism. The next two chapters then look at the question of the land. And this is where I was totally shocked and tripped up myself. My argument in the book is that the promise of the land is there unquestionably in the Old Testament. For Catholics, then the question becomes, how does this promise relate to 1948 Israel, uh, 47, the state of Israel? And to give a brief answer, I say, yes, this has theological significance. And I call this move uh, minimalist Zionism to differentiate it from lots of other forms of Zionism, but also to make it clear that there's a theological underwriting, but no detraction at all from the Palestinian rights to a homeland in that area. The last chapter then turns to the question of mission, which is really a very painful, difficult subject. I um, show that the Catholic Church actually throws a lot of smoke and uh, flares here, using different words and terminology, dropping the word mission, choosing the word witness, etc. But the basic point is something that can't be backed off from, in my view, is the Catholic Church wanting to say that there must be a witness by Catholics to the Jewish people about the truth of the faith? And I answer yes. And it's a dangerous answer, mainly because it brings in the whole issue of Hebrew Catholics, or in other circles, sometimes the equivalent of Messianic Jews. And this is a real apple cart disturber, one that I don't like, but I can't get away from as part of the implications of uh, what's emerging. So Holly, that's the basic synopsis of the book. And the most delightful thing for me was the number of surprises I got, uh, which meant this was actually, you know, enjoyable research. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity to discuss it further. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <clears throat> what I'd like to do again is to offer a very brief introduction to the four respondents we have. Um, I want to, again, just say a word of thanks not only to um, Professor DaCosta, but also to these respondents who have given time and effort to preparing their thoughts. Um, we'll begin with Rabbi David Sandmel. Um, David Sandmel is currently Director of Interreligious Engagement at the Anti-Defamation uh, League. And his most important um, qualification for, I think, for this discussion is that he is one of a number of um, Jewish thinkers who graciously talks to Christians, <laughs> tries to um, <laughs> help them make sense of things and, and listens also. Um, and secondly, um, going in order, we'll hear from Professor Ruth Langer. Professor Langer is professor of theology at Boston College, and she is a noted expert on Jewish liturgy and also on Christian Jewish relations. So we'd have to add a second member to that group. Um, thirdly, we will hear from Philip Cunningham. Phil Cunningham is um, professor of theology and um, also <clears throat> director of the Institute for Catholic Jewish Catholic Relations. 
at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. Um, Professor Cunningham has a long history of engaging in um, Christian thought about Judaism and Christian Jewish dialogue. And finally, we will hear from uh, Professor Bruce Marshall. Um, Professor Marshall teaches at uh, Southern Methodist University. He is their layman professor of Christian doctrine. Um, and he also it comes to us today after um, concerted and careful thought about the way in which both um, the people, Israel, are an indispensable part of Christian thought, um, as well as some implications for the question of um, conversation between those two groups. So again, only brief introductions um, with apologies for that. And we will turn to you, please, um, Rabbi Samuel. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction. And I can say without any irony that some of my best friends are Christians. <laughs> so first, I, I want to thank the Society for Post uh, Supersessionist Theology and the organizers of this session for inviting me to participate. I also want to thank uh, Dr. DaCosta, who I will now refer to as Gavin moving forward, um, uh, for this impressive and, and significant book. I'm particularly grateful as, as an outsider for the clarity with which he leads the reader to the complicated interplay of history and documents and levels of authority and other matters related to the establishment of doctrine within the church. Before engaging in the substance of the book, a few words about the perspective that I bring to this task. The most obvious and perhaps the most important is that I am neither a Catholic nor a Christian, nor for that matter, a theologian. I'm a liberal rabbi, and though I have a religious studies degree in the history and literature of Judaism and Christianity and antiquity, much of my career has focused on what I might call interreligious advocacy rather than academia. I concur with Gavin's assertion that methodologically Jewish voices cannot be the basis for Catholic doctrine. Thus, as a purely theological or religious matter, I would not offer an opinion about whether superstitionism, fulfillment, or dual covenant best reflects the teaching of the magisterium. I do believe, however, that it is appropriate to ask questions about the practical implications of doctrine uh, when it has the potential to impinge directly on my life and the life of my community. Catholic doctrine becomes my personal concern rather than perhaps an intellectual concern when it adversely affects the way that Catholics view Jews and Judaism and especially when it leads to behavior on the part of the church or individuals that is detrimental to the Jewish community as it has, as has been the case in the past. So if I emphasize the practical implications of a theological treatment about the Jewish people, that may be why. In light of that history, the exploration of neuralgic topics like supersessionism, covenant, land, state and mission, uh, and I'll leave Ruth to tackle that one, uh, must be done with great sensitivity. In regard to the land and state, that's, this sensitivity must extend, as, as Gavin just mentioned, not just to Jews, but also to Palestinians and others. I commend Gavin for the care and awareness with which he addresses all these issues, especially when he knows the conclusions may be controversial and offensive. When I raise questions about the possible practical implications of some of the conclusions of the book, many of which the author himself acknowledges, these should not be seen as critiques of the conclusions themselves, but rather an attempt to move the discussion beyond the understandable theoretical discussion in the book. I now want to turn my attention to the distinction Gavin draws between soft supersessionism and fulfillment. I do follow the logic of Gavin's preference for the term fulfillment as a response to the idea of replacement or rejection that's inherent in supersessionism. And I also note that he accepts that fulfillment itself is supersessionist in what he calls a loose sense. I do wonder whether using the term fulfillment might inadvertently serve to obscure its inherent soft supersessionism and thus the problem of supersessionism itself. 
So I suggest perhaps that preserving supersessionism with a modifier, perhaps exclusive supersessionism or inclusive supersessionism, or if I may, extrinsic or intrinsic supersessionism, uh, those might be more precise and more instructive as a theological concept in as much as it would demand that terms be unpacked and explained, including the history. Similarly, regardless of whether it is called fulfillment or supersessionism, Gavin does not shy away from the view that alongside the enduring covenant and everything that goes from that, there remains a fundamental lack in Judaism. Though, of course, I do not consider my treatise like anything. As Dabru Amet states, there are irreconcilable differences between Jews and Christians. We make conflicting truth claims. At the same time, we know that general knowledge of Nostra Aetate is spotty in the church, and the idea that Judaism is lacking in its hard supersessionist sense still persists. In the book, this lack is carefully couched in the author's broader, positive, and respectful approach to Jews and Judaism, which is integral to his theology, and therefore offers an affirmative alternative to the negativity of replacement supersessionism. And yet, perpetuating the idea that Judaism is lacking still makes me uneasy. It would need to be thought very carefully in order not to reinforce old ideas. One of the perennial topics of discussion and frankly frustration at Jewish Catholic consultations is the need to educate both the wider church and the Jewish community about how relationships have developed since 1965. In his discussion of the efficacy of the ceremonial law in light of the enduring covenant, uh, Gavin raises the possibility that at some point the church may have to define which cultic acts are in fact effective. Even if this question is an inevitable outcome uh, of Gavin's argument, in practical terms, it strikes me as perhaps a step too far. On what basis are cultic acts deemed to be effective? What is the status of those that don't meet the standard? Equally problematic is the comment that Christians have an enormous amount to learn from the religious practices of rabbinical Judaism when their practices and beliefs derive from the covenant never revoked. That's my, my emphasis if you were looking at my text. Again, what criteria might the church use to evaluate rabbinic practice? Finally, Gavin understandably points out that identifying which forms of contemporary Judaism have these characteristics is problematic. This question has not been adequately addressed. Now, this raises the possibility, at least the theoretical possibility, that the church might at some point decide that one form of Judaism is, you should forgive me, kosher, while another is treif. Once again, I do understand how this arises from uh, Gavin's line of thinking, but I have to question the appropriateness on the relational level rather than on a theological level of the church deciding which expressions of Judaism are covenantal. The discussion of ceremonial law seems to me to reflect either a misunderstanding of Jewish categories or the overlay of a Christian or Catholic one on the system of mitzvot that does not reflect classical Jewish self-understanding. From a Jewish perspective, all 613 mitzvot are equally authoritative and covenantal. The fact that some cannot be observed for circumstantial reasons, uh, destruction of the temple, lack of sovereignty, being located outside of the land, does not change their essential authoritative status. Furthermore, there are many non-ceremonial mitzvot that are observed by Jews today and are understood to be part of the covenant. Since ceremonial is not a Jewish category, how would the church decide which laws are ceremonial and which are not? If the distinction is a Catholic distinction, is it methodologically sound to overlay it on the Jewish tradition? In the same passage that I cited above, Gavin writes, 
The Vatican has consistently developed conversations with religiously practicing Jews and not those who identify as Jewish who may be secular, atheist, or agnostic. Now, uh, this is not entirely accurate and draws attention to another terminological problem. The International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations, IJKIC, of which I currently serve as vice chair, is the official dialogue partner of the uh, uh, Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews on behalf of the global Jewish community. It does take a little bit of chutzpah to, to, uh, to say that one represents the entire global Jewish community, but we do it anyway. Uh, Itchkick is a consortium of Jewish religious and non-religious communal organizations, including the one for which I currently work. Some in the Orthodox Jewish community avoid what they consider to be, quote, religious dialogue based on a contested reading of uh, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik's 1965 article, Confrontation. There has also been a discussion among Jewish scholars, Jewish studies scholars of late, about the appropriateness of the term religion and even the term Judaism when applied to Jews and their tradition. Delving into the various meanings of the word religion and Judaism might be a fitting topic for future Jewish Catholic consultations. One of the underlying concepts of the book is that the full authority of the magisterium stands behind the biblical teaching that the covenant with biblical Israel, God's people, is irrevocable. The difference between the pre- and post-Vatican church do not reflect, quote, doctrinal discontinuity, but rather the epistemological presuppositions of each group differ. It is common in the Jewish community to refer to Nostra Aetate as heralding a sea change or a Copernican revolution, to quote the title of a book in the church, perhaps because as Gavin himself notes, Jews are, quote, not wedded to any theories of continuity that Catholic scholars might hold regarding the magisterium. After reading this book, I wonder if these descriptions of Notre, Nostra Aetate are accurate or if they represent a Jewish perspective rather than a shared one. So I'd like to ask if there is a better metaphor uh, for describing the post-conciliar church that more accurately reflects the position argued in this book. This rich, informative, fascinating, and provocative book provides a comprehensive and accessible synthesis of Catholic thinking on the most significant questions raised by the Second Vatican Council regarding Jews and Judaism. What are the implications of the claim that God's covenant with the Jews is irrevocable? And how does that claim coexist with the belief that, quote, all salvation causally comes from Jesus Christ? The, quote, modest findings and fragile arguments offered here suggest some possible solutions that demand further discussion among Catholics themselves and between Jews and Catholics. And I look forward to learning from both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll turn now to um, Ruth Langer to hear her thoughts. Let me thank, first of all, the organizers for convening this discussion of Gavin da Costa's very important, thoughtful and thought provoking book and for inviting me to participate today. As David indicated, I'm going to use my time to dive deeper into what was really the most serious critique of the book that I published in a review of the book that's already out in Studies in Christian Jewish Relations. Uh, and that is to talk, to talk about this issue of mission. Gavin's book probes the boundaries of Catholic post-conciliar teachings about Jews, identifying the trajectories for future developments. As one educated into the rabbinic fascination with exactly such boundary areas, as an active participant in Christian Jewish dialogue, I'm going to focus on this discussion of mission. As Gavin acknowledges, this is an area in which Christians have historically caused Jews immense suffering. Mission has consequently been a fraught topic in Catholic Jewish dialogue, especially over the past about two decades. Gavin concludes his book with this discussion after carefully laying its groundwork in the earlier chapters. 
Foundational here is the doctrinal requirement that Catholics must assent to the truth that all salvation comes through Jesus Christ, who is the Jewish Messiah and the embodiment of the fullness of God's truth. Therefore, those who assert that God's covenant with the Jews is irrevocable must be soft supersessionists who understand that God's irrevocable covenant with Israel is, albeit eschatologically, fulfilled through Jesus Christ. This eschatological deferral creates a theological space in the meantime for Jews' own understanding of the covenant. Thus, in Catholic understanding, today's Jews do not sin by remaining outside the church. This validation of current Jewish covenantal life does require that Catholics clarify their self-understanding as a missionary church mandated to bring all of humanity to, to Christ. If God's covenant with the Jews is irrevocable, are Jews to be the object of evangelism? Da Costa first demonstrates that he has heard and sought to internalize the historical Jewish communal perception of mission as seeking the extinction, immediate or ultimate, of the Jewish people. Genocide lurks, even on those occasions when the Jewish objects of mission are not murdered. Da Costa asks, can Christian mission be credible in the shadow of the Shoah? Da Costa seeks to harmonize this ethical concern with the magisterian's explicit teaching that Jews are indeed included in the mandate to evangelize all peoples. However, the reality of God's irrevocable covenant with Israel and history requires a modified manner of Christian witness. And he emphasizes that witness, not mission, is the correct term because mission applies to situations where Christians are dispelling false gods or idols. However, I would add, the practical difference is minimal. An invitation to conversion still motivates this witness, if more subtly. Da Costa proposes a path forward that melds the mandates that Catholics include Jews in their mission or witness, and that they do so in a way that is indeed credible in the wake of the Shoah. His key suggestion is that because of the irrevocable covenant, this witness and the hope for conversion resulting from it must not eradicate Jewish identity. In other words, it can no longer be complicit in genocide or even lesser forms of violence. Jewish identity must remain intact. So how can mission not threaten Jewish identity? Da Costa points to specific cases, past and present, where Jewish and Christian identity have been merged, where the Jewish covenant was contained within Christianity. The most important model was the Jewish Christ followers of the early church before Judaizing became heretical. The earliest church's distinct missions to Jews and to Gentiles could be revived, he suggests. Today's Messianic Jews and Hebrew Catholics are analogous Jewish followers of Christ. Discussion about the implications for the church and for the Jewish community about recognizing this distinct ecclesia ex circumcisione are in their infancy, da Costa indicates. And indeed his discussion here, though anticipated earlier in the book, is comparatively brief. Now let me admit that I find this trajectory quite troubling. And the question is why? Da Costa is sensitive to the historical pain that Christian mission has brought the Jewish community. However, as long as mission shapes Christian thinking about Jews, it creates a barrier to deep Christian Jewish interreligious understanding. I recognize that mission has explicit New Testament authority and is central to Christian self-understanding. But dialogue is not a competition motivated by desire to convert, i.e. annihilate the other. A safe space with rules that all can trust and a search to understand the other's otherness 
is a prerequisite for authentic dialogue. Without it, in our world where participation is voluntary, dialogue simply becomes something to avoid. Are we seeking mutual understanding or are we probing for weaknesses in the other so as to change them? Historically, power imbalances created situations of danger for Jews. Today's Jews are freer to walk away. Mission never admitted legitimate religious competition. De Costa suggests that a solution to the Catholic conundrum might be found by a focus on categories of people who already straddle the boundaries between our communities. Jews who accept Christ or Catholics who live culturally Jewish lives preserve a Jewish identity that is acceptable in today's church. Their Jewishness, he says, remains. However, this would be a Catholic definition of what proper Jewish identity entails. It would not meet the powerful formula for cross-communal understanding expressed first in the 1974 guidelines that Catholics should strive to understand Jews as they see themselves. In other words, de Costa's lifting up of those inhabiting the boundary between Jewish and Christian identity as Jews ignores the traditional halachic and even liberal Jewish definitions of Jewish identity. So who is a Jew? What constitutes Jewish identity? As de Costa knows, there is no single answer to these questions. Jewish identity is a complex amalgam of ethnicity, culture, peoplehood, and religion. These mix and play out in myriad ways. One normally becomes a Jew by birth. Conversion to Judaism is a kind of adoption or naturalization into this extended family. For those born Jews, those elements identified by Western culture as religion are elements of this larger familial culture. And these people's fundamental Jewishness is neither dependent on their choice to believe or to say, let's say, to eat Jewishly. Neither chicken soup nor speaking Hebrew makes one a Jew. Conversion, although, does require active affirmation of Jewish religion, we have to acknowledge. Just as Catholics understand baptism to be a one-time irrevocable sacrament independent of actual faith, Judaism teaches that anyone born or naturalized into the Jewish community irrevocably retains a Jewish identity. In this sense, de jure, Jews who adopt another religion do remain Jews indelibly. But in reality, it isn't so simple. Both Jews and Catholics historically have grieved and war over border boundary crossers out of their community, labeling them apostates, while welcoming those who join them as converts. Our age of dialogue, spiritual seeking, and intermarriage challenges challenges us all to accept de facto those leaving our communities with greater equanimity and validation of personal choice and freedom. If a Jew can become a Catholic, then a Catholic can become a Jew. This challenges our concepts of indelible identity. It is here that our different understandings of identity create confusion though. The Catholic who becomes a Jew should become culturally, ethnically, and, re and religiously a Jew. Straddling the boundary suggests that the conversion or naturalization was incomplete. Most Jews project this same understanding onto Jews who become Christians, even if they retain cultural Jewish identity markers. Classically, apostate Jews were considered sinners and banished from the Jewish community. Today, instead, we respect their free choice, but their de jure Jewishness is nominal unless they choose to repent and return. 
DaCosta mentions Michael Wischigat-Grad's challenge to Cardinal Lustiger that asked how Lustiger understood himself to be a Jewish cardinal. Wischigat did not challenge the authenticity of Lustiger's Christianity. Rather, he wondered if Lustiger with his Christian faith could possibly agree to live a life defined by halakha, not as exterior culture acts, but because God commanded them of him. Without this connection to Torah, any Jewish identity markers, while they may be culturally Jewish, are no longer religiously so. Any ethnic subgroup within the church has analogous cultural identity markers. Think of an Irish wake or an Italian Sunday dinner. Thus, a Hebrew Catholic is religiously a Catholic, even if she eats kugel or prays with a talit. However, a Catholic who becomes a Jew must theologically choose a life according to Torah and some version of rabbinic interpretations of it. For the vast majority of the Jewish community, that includes an understanding of God and God's expectations of us that is other than the key teachings of Christianity or Islam. For the vast majority of the Jewish community, acceptance, acceptance of Jesus as God incarnate and as the Messiah whose death and resurrection enabled an otherwise unattainable salvation from sin, these are key markers of being a Christian. Jewish religious identity embeds a different set of beliefs about God and messianic expectations incompatible with these Christian creeds. Thus, there is still work to do. Jews can be comfortable with no active mission or deferred mission, but Christian support for groups that seek to convert Jews religiously while retaining Jewish culture is, if anything, more threatening to Jewish existence than overt active mission. To invoke the late Sir Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, it is when we honor the dignity of each other's difference that we truly affirm one another. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a really helpful increasing clarification of the issues at hand and we'll turn to um, Dr. Philip Cunningham. Thank you. And uh, I thank uh, also the organizers for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I'm going to accompany my remarks uh, with a PowerPoint slideshow, which won't surprise some folks that know me. So uh, let me share my screen with you uh, if I could. So I would uh, like to frame my remarks um, by recalling an iconic moment in Catholic Jewish relations that occurred 20 years ago. Now, Pope John Paul II's prayer at the Western Wall 
was the same prayer that he had offered two weeks earlier at an unprecedented mass of pardon at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. During the homily on, uh, during that liturgy that on March the 12th, John Paul said that the great Jubilee was an opportunity for quote, today's faithful to recognize along with their own sins, the sins of yesterday's Christians in the light of careful historical and theological discernment, end quote. Among the misdeeds that the Pope and curial leaders confessed were, quote, sins against the people of Israel, end quote. Two weeks later, as we have just seen, the pontiff prayed in Jewish fashion by inserting a written text of the same prayer into the crevices of the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Notice that the prayer is structured according to Catholic penitential practice. There is a confession of sin. There is an expression of remorse. There is a plea for forgiveness. And there is what we Catholics call a firm purpose of amendment or penance or reparation. What are we going to do to change our behavior for the sins that we have committed? Now, it seems to me that the fact that John Paul solemnly confessed these sins in St. Peter's Basilica and then signed, sealed, and personally delivered this commitment at the remnant of the retaining walls of the Second Temple gave his prayer a transcendent spiritual potency and a gravity that surpasses mere written documents. It was a profound public act of contrition and reparation that I believe imposes a grave responsibility on Catholic theologians. It also steers doctrinal development in the service of building relationship. Indeed, Gavin DaCosta's book is part of a vast reform in the Catholic community to which Bruce Marshall, Holly Taylor Kuhlman, myself, thousands of other Catholic theologians are committed with the help of insightful Jewish dialogue partners like Rabbis Langer and Sandmel and many others. I agree totally with Gavin's statement on page 13 that the Catholic church while cautious is quite radical and innovative uh, in this field of Christian relations with Jews. It is constantly pushing forward the boundaries. It's an amazing fact that since Nostra Aetate in 1965, Catholic leaders have said positive things about Jews and Judaism that literally had never been said before in church history. Gavin writes that Catholic ecclesial texts, quote, provide a kind of guide rope into uncharted territory, end quote. His constructive theological suggestions are based on how he follows these guide ropes, but, quote, others find these guide ropes uh, leading elsewhere. This is true for me regarding some of the topics that Gavin examines in the book. This is unsurprising since in the Catholic community, there is a rich variety of theological approaches and methods that are part of our tradition. Since time permits me to consider only a few themes uh, in Catholic doctrines on the Jewish people after Vatican II, I will focus my observations on three alliteratively phrased topics, each followed by some questions for Gavin. I'm going to zoom through them very quickly, and I apologize in advance for the speed at which I'm going to move, uh, but I was uh, warned that Holly had an electrical shock that she could send through the uh, airwaves or the, the internet, so I, I'm going to move fast. My first topic is going to be doctrines, dogmas, and declarations. My second topic, Christology and covenanting, and third, conversion or conversation the latter of which is, as I see now, going to overlap somewhat with what Ruth had just discussed. So to move to the first topic, and I'm going to move through this more quickly than the other two, uh, Gavin argues or says, quote, on its own, Nostra Aetate is not a doctrinal document. Now, doctrine is usually understood as something that the church authoritatively teaches. And so this claim seems to me to be a bit idiosyncratic, especially in the light of these considerations out of many other possibilities that one could imagine. First of all, the document was approved overwhelmingly by a worldwide council of Catholic bishops uh, and cardinals in union with the Pope. Secondly, as Cardinal Bayer wrote a year after its promulgation, and he, as we all know, guided and oversaw the passage of the document through the council, 
He wrote that it was the church itself who speaks through conciliar documents. Quote, she is evidently teaching in a solemn and universally binding way. Um, so this raises questions for me. There are many papal addresses that attribute determining authority to Nostra Aetate for one example out of lots. John Paul II, after reviewing key points in Nostra Aetate said, quote, it is on the basis of all this that we, Catholic Church, recognize with utmost clarity the path along which we should proceed with the Jewish community is one of fraternal dialogue and fruitful collaboration. Cardinal Kirk Koch, current president of the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews, in discussing a organization that is currently in a schismatic relationship with the church said, if a group doesn't accept the council, it should ask itself whether it is Catholic. Um, that makes it sounds pretty authoritative. Gavin in uh, uh, substantiating the claim uh, cites one Ilaria Morali that Nostra Aetate has no doctrinal significance since it was conceived as a practical appendix to Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. This doesn't make any sense given the composition process historically of Nostra Aetate, which was not a response to uh, Lumen Gentium, but to the Shoah. Gavin also cites a 1985 Synod of Bishops to echo morality, but that Synod actually said that the four conciliar constitutions, quote, provide the interpretive key, end quote, to declarations, not that the declarations were written to illustrate constitutions. It's kind of putting it backwards. The Synod also stated, quote, it does not listed to separate pastoral character from the doctrinal vigor of these documents, end quote, as, which is what morality attempts to do. You can't really separate the, the pastoral and the practical uh, in Catholic thought. John O'Malley, a leading uh, analysis, uh, analyzer of the council wrote, Vatican II is a pastoral council because of its teaching, its doctrine. Vatican II is pastoral by being doctrinal. So my question to Gavin on this topic is, why don't you want Nostra Aetate to be considered doctrinal? Is your preference based solely on a divorce, which would be problematic between orthodoxy and orthopraxy? And what do you exactly mean by doctrine and what is its basis? Continuing along, almost going to warp speed here, so hang on. Uh, Christology and covenanting. Gavin sketches three ways in which the magisterial claim that the covenant with Israel is irrevocable could be interpreted. Uh, David and Ruth have both touched on this. The three ways that Gavin describes are one, Israel's covenant is transferred to the new Israel, in other words, supersessionism. Two, what Gavin calls the fulfillment position that Jewish covenanting is not abrogated, but it is non salvific until Jews embrace Christ. Then Christ's irrevocable, excuse me, then God's irrevocable promises to the chosen people will be fulfilled. And he describes uh, thirdly that uh, biblical Jews. Uh, as well as rabbinic Jews are in an irrevocable covenant that is sufficient for salvation in itself. The Jewish covenant per se is, excuse me, is sufficient for salvation. Therefore, there are dual covenants that are salvific and inaugurated by God. And Gavin calls this, fittingly enough, the dual covenant position. Now, I agree that Gavin, with Gavin that Catholic teaching rejects option three because it leaves Judaism, quote, ontologically unrelated to Christ, end quote. As Gavin says, Catholic Church also rejects now option one. On this topic, I would insist that covenant is a metaphor of a relationship, not the name of a unique metaphysical object, and that changes things. This is an important uh, move. The fourth option that Gavin briefly mentions is all salvation is from Christ even within Judaism. He remarks that if this were the case, then logically it would be better for Jews to become Christians than remain Jews if the salvation within Judaism came from Christ. I don't find that logic compelling since being saved isn't really a pressing issue for Jews as it is for Christians. Why should they feel a need to become Christians simply because Christians think that Christ Jesus is involved in Jewish covenantal life? The reverse kind of would be uh, for me to suddenly want to abandon Christianity because some Jews tell me that I should be observing the Noahide laws and that's the only thing that will make me right with God. Well, that doesn't really incline me to leave Christianity. 
In my view, the river of Catholic doctrinal development is flowing toward a fourth approach, which I will call Christians and Jews as covenanting companions, co-covenanting companions with the divine word. Now, let me spell this out um, in a series of statements. It's Christian dogma that God is triune. The three who are one are always involved in everything that God does. Two, it is Christian dogma that the word of God was incarnated in the first century Jew, Jesus of Nazareth, crucified and raised. Because of the hypostatic union, to use Chalcedonian language, the glorified Jesus participates in everything the word of God does today. Three, it is Christian dogma that Christians covenant with the one God of Israel, at least since Marcion was rejected. Four, it is now Catholic doctrine that Jews also covenant with the one God. Therefore, and I stress from a Christian perspective, uh, Catholic theologians are not asking Jews to affirm this. The Holy One with, him, with whom Jews covenant must indisputably be the same one God whom Christians know as triune, even though God has not been revealed to Jews in that way. Also, therefore, from a Christian perspective, the Creator Sustainer, the Word united with the glorified Jesus, and the Spirit are all dynamically active in Israel's covenanting with God. This logic undergirds a paragraph in the 2015 document of the Vatican Commission for Religious Relations with Jews, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Let me cite this paragraph and just breaking it up. God revealed God's self and God's word so that it may be understood by humanity in actual historical situations. This word invites all people to respond. If their responses are in accord with the word of God, they stand in right relationship with God. For Jews, this word can be learned through the Torah and the traditions based on it, i.e. rabbinic Judaism. The Torah is the instruction for a successful light and right relationship with God. Whoever observed the Torah has life in its fullness. Sounds like John 10.10. 10. By observing the Torah, the Jew receives a share in communion with God. In this regard, continues this uh, commission document, Pope Francis has stated, the Christian confessions find their unity in Christ. Judaism finds its unity in the Torah. Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the word of God made flesh in the world. For Jews, the word of God is present above all in the Torah. Both faith traditions find their foundation in the one God, the God of the covenant who reveals himself through his word. Um, now, um, very notable, I think, in this quote, and there are others that could be uh, adduced in this regard, um, is that uh, certain of the phrases here have definite soteriological cadences, right relationship, communion with God, life in its fullness. It's also important that the word of God is described as not just imparting data, but inviting people into a relationship. And also significant is the fact that the word of God is operative in the Torah for Jews and, of course, in the personal relationship with Christ Jesus that Christians have. What are the implications of this? It can be said in Catholic theology that with the incarnation, the covenantal life between God of Israel and the Israel of God became even more intimate. Jesus' Jewishness is necessary to grasp the fullness of his humanity, and the incarnation's significance for Israel continued since the race Jesus lives in glory with the divine word. I'm going to skip through these two quotes very quickly, but this whole logic is what impelled Pope Benedict XVI, also Pope John Paul II, and Pope Francis to urge dialogue with Jews on an ever-increasing and extended um, basis. I'll just cite the, the italicized uh, sentence in Pope Francis's quote at the bottom, quote, God continues to work among the people of the old covenant and to bring forth treasures of wisdom which flow from their encounter with God's word. It's a really important sentence, I think, but let me move on and ask this question of Gavin. Would you agree that describing Christians as co-covenanting companions, both uh, in bleh, deeply engaged with the word of God, that this coheres with ecclesiastical guide ropes you mentioned, uh, that can lead to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant? Let me move on to my third and final uh, topic of conversion or conversation. Uh, I want to begin um, by... Um, citing a sentence from Nostra Aetate, a revolutionary sentence. This sacred synod wants to foster and recommend that mutual understanding and respect, which is the fruit above all of biblical and theological studies, as well as fraternal dialogues. Now, 
I think this is a revolutionary sentence because a call for a theological Catholic Jewish dialogue was literally unheard of in pre-Vatican II ecclesiastical texts. In fact, they called for avoidance of such contact. The experience of the last 55 years I, demonstrates, I believe, that the ensuing and deepening dialogue has established a new locus theologicus for Catholic theology. It establishes that interpersonal and intercommunal relationship is key for a post-Shoah Catholic theology of relations with Jews. In chapter five, Gavin considers the question, if the Jewish covenant given by God is irrevocable, is mission to convert the Jewish people still valid? Uh, Gavin, as Ruth uh, summarized, uh, answers that affirmatively, I'm gonna answer it negatively. Gavin writes, it is not possible to find salvific grace outside, I think better would be not involving Christ. And while Jews may participate in salvation as Jews, that participation can only be understood by Catholics, underscore, with reference to Jesus Christ, end quote. I agree with Gavin on this. The question is not whether there's a Catholic mission to Jews, but rather in what that mission consists. Post Noster Aetate, ecclesiastical texts are going to be of limited help with this question, since none of them imagined that the sui generis relationship with Jews led to any other option but conversionary missions. And the reason for that was the persistent blood curse teaching that, to my knowledge, nobody challenged until the 20th century. Gavin is also quite right when he writes the doc that Vatican documents use important terms inconsistently. I note that when given a choice among various usages, Gavin tends to the most restrictive reading. For example, quote, I will use evangelization, says Gavin, only in the narrow sense, unless otherwise specified, end quote. Now, I follow what Gavin called the ecclesiastical guide ropes differently, and I submit that A, the mission of the church toward Jews is dialogue, B, in dialogue, Christians always witness to their faith in Christ, not with persuasive intent, but to learn mutually from our respective faith relationships with God, and C, this dialogue fulfills the church's evangelizing mandate. Um, with that, let me quickly, really quickly, and only partially sketch out the development of this over the last 56 years of the theme that the mission of the Catholic Church toward Jews is dialogue. During the council itself, Archbishop Patrick O'Boyle noted that if we say anything about a conscious intention of trying to convert Jews, we set up a new and high wall of division, which makes fruitful dialogue impossible. It would be better for us to remain within the limits of our knowledge and respect God's hidden ways. At a meeting of the Vatican with Worldwide, with Idkik, actually, uh, in uh, 1977, uh, Tommaso Federici took this a step further and said, in dialogue, we have to have mutual respect and esteem for the other's religious identity. I'm going to skim along. As I already quoted John Paul II, at the very beginning of his papacy, he said, we recognize with the utmost clarity that the path along which the Catholic Church should proceed with Jews is fraternal dialogue and collaboration. He went on to say at the great synagogue in Rome a few years later that our fundamental difference between Jews and Catholics has been the attachment of us Catholics to the person and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, a son of your people. But this attachment is located in the order of faith, in the free ascent of the mind and heart guided by the spirit. It can never be the object of exterior pressure in one sense or the other. And that's why we want to deepen dialogue and loyalty and friendship and respect for one another's intimate conversions. Um, I think the wisdom of recognizing that a Catholic commitment to dialogue with Jews required the abandonment of the long history of seeking to convert Jews became evident in an episode that occurred in the United States in the first decade of this century. Um, and it revolved around a document called Reflections on Covenant and Mission that the official national dialogue between the US Bishops Office of Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs and the National Council of Synagogues uh, wondered why uh, the Catholic Church, unlike some other Christian groups, was not funding offices to convert Jews. Um, the, uh, you can read here the quote for yourself, that Reflections in Covenant and Mission um, uh, rejected an ongoing um, targeted campaign to convert Jews. Whoops, went a little bit too fast there. Um, 
in re, uh, seven years later, in 2009, uh, personnel in the offices of ecumenical and interreligious affairs uh, and of doctrine preferred a clarification stating, though Christian participation in interreligious dialogue would not normally include an explicit invitation to baptism and entrance into the church, the Christian dialogue partner is always giving witness to the following of Christ to which all are implicitly invited. Now, the possibility that the setting of Catholic Jewish dialogue could be the occasion for Catholics to invite Jews to receive baptism stunned those involved in the dialogue. All the major Jewish organizations and movements wrote a unanimous letter, which is in itself historically noteworthy, to the Bishops' Conference ex to explain why they would have to withdraw from dialogue if this was to be the new Catholic understanding of it. Quote, once Jewish Christian dialogue has been formally characterized as an invitation, whether explicit or implicit to apostatize, then Jewish participation becomes untenable. Now, uh, the, the, the vibrant dialogue in the US between Catholics and Jews seemed on the verge of, of collapsing. Gavin doesn't continue with his narrative about these developments um, and omits the response of the bishops who led the USCCB in 2009. Within a matter of weeks, they responded to this Jewish letter and took the unheard of step, at least to me, of excising the language of explicit and implicit invitations from the note of, of uh, previous June. And they stated instead that Jewish Catholic dialogue, one of the blessed fruits of the Second Vatican Council has never been and never will be used by the Catholic Church as a mean of proselytism, nor is it intended as a disguised invitation to baptism. Uh, far from positing, as Gavin writes, that uh, a theological rationale for the mission to the Jewish people was contained in this episode. In fact, it actually reinforced the priority of dialogue in which Catholics give witness to their faith in Christ that is not concealing conversionary intent. Pope Benedict XVI had a rocky moment in terms of Catholic-Jewish relations. These included a controversy over his revised Good Friday prayer for Jews in the Tridentine Rite and the lifting of excommunications of four bishops of the Priestly Society of St. Pius X, one of whom turned out to have given videotaped interviews denying the Shoah. Just before Benedict's visit to the Great Synagogue of Rome in January 2010, a cartoon in the Italian Jewish newspaper Pagina Bracci uh, depicted him as crossing the Tiber from the Vatican to the synagogue on a tightrope, holding a balancing rod with the words conversion and dialogue on opposite ends, with a crowd awaiting him outside waving various signs. Uh, I think this cartoon captures a lot of what people were feeling uh, in terms of Benedict's thinking at the time. Now, whatever degree of uncertainty uh, Benedict may have felt was apparently resolved when in a 2011 book, he affirmatively cited the Abbas Hildegard Brem that in the light of Romans 11.25, the church was not concerned herself with the conversion of the Jews. Uh, moreover, as Emeritus Pope Benedict, as Emeritus Pope Benedict wrote in 2018, to Israel, therefore, there was not and still is not a mission, but rather the dialogue about whether Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Logos. And a little bit more recently in 2018, he wrote, as far as humans can foresee, this dialogue within ongoing history will never lead to an agreement between the two interpretations of the Bible. This is God's business at the end of history. For now, it remains to both sides to struggle for the proper insight and to reveren reverentially respect the perspective of the other side, end quote, which brings us to Pope Francis. He has spoken about his many experiences unique for a Pope of religious dialogue with Jews, especially his numerous conversations with, uh, over the years, with his fellow Argentine Rabbi Abraham Skorka. Note this video in which he discusses the personal significance of making friends across religious lines. Francis speaks in Spanish, but please follow the English subtitles.
se desarrolló desde la posibilidad de ser cristiano y ninguno tuvo la pretensión de convertir a los demás. So I'm going to move along and conclude because uh, I've gone over time and thank you Holly for not electrocuting me. Um, I'll just end uh, this third part by saying uh, the question of the proper institutional relationship of the Catholic Church to Jews is unprecedented before our day. Whatever guidance past tradition can provide is conditioned by the uncritiqued claim until the, after the Second World War that Jews were a sui generis people as the only people under a divine malediction. Nostra Aetate's rejection of that allegation has enabled Catholics to see Jews as sui generis for a different reason. They are co-covenanting companions with whom we must dialogue instead. Uh, Gavin has seen my questions in advance, so I'm just going to skip over this uh, and say, what do you think of this? <laughs> and finally, uh, let me just end with this final two, three conclusions. Gavin's book is the latest fruit of his invaluable work over the years to ground post Nostra Aetate developments in the historical Catholic tradition. If post Nostra Aetate teachings were totally discontinuous with the tradition, as distinct from having no internal contradictions at all, I agree with Gavin that there would indeed be dire theological implications. And I think we both agree that that uh, is not the case. Uh, however, Pope Benedict has observed about Vatican II that, quote, it is precisely in a combination of continuity and discontinuity at different levels that the very nature of true reform consists, end quote. So some continuity, excuse me, some discontinuity is inevitable and it's really healthy if the church is to think new thoughts, which I think we must do after the Shoah. What is the acceptable level of discontinuity in magisterial teaching is a question that we're probably gonna be struggling with from now until the end of time. And so I thank Gavin for his assiduous work along with other theological methods of inquiry he is contributing to what he called the constant pushing forward of the boundaries that is needed to enact the Catholic Church's commitment to, quote, genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant, end quote. Thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. Uh, Bruce Marshall, we'll turn to you. I better unmute myself before, uh, before I start talking. Uh, since Vatican II, no more important work has appeared by a Catholic theologian on the Jews and Judaism than Gavin de Costa's Catholic doctrines on the Jewish people after Vatican II, together with its predecessor book on the Council itself. Among the many merits of Gavin's work is precisely that he treats the church's relation to the Jewish people and Judaism as a doctrinal matter rather than seeing it only as a pastoral, political, catechetical, or public relations issue. For Catholics, it is all the latter, no doubt. But first of all, it is a doctrinal matter, one that poses difficult questions about the coherence of Catholic teaching, as Gavin sees very clearly. Our own time has seen a remarkable development of doctrine within Catholicism, which Gavin's two books carefully document. Taken together, Lumen Gentium, Nostra Aetate, and subsequent papal teaching establish as normative Catholic doctrine the proposition that God's covenant with the Jewish people has never been revoked in John Paul II's momentous phrase. Put positively, the God known to and worshipped by the church maintains with the Jewish people today until the end of time, the covenant made with their forefathers according to the flesh, the covenant attested with great clarity and force by the Christian scriptures. Any Catholic must assume that this is an authentic development of doctrine, 
given the highly and in some respects supremely authoritative sources from which it comes. At the same time, Human Gentium, Nostra Aetate, subsequent papal teaching, the Christian scriptures and the Catholic tradition from early on teach that God desires every human being to enter the one church of Christ, the Roman Catholic church by faith and baptism. How can this be? The two teachings, both of which now have the status of normative Catholic doctrine are apparently incompatible. God's abiding covenant with the Jews seems to deny the uniqueness and universality of the saving work of Christ as enacted by his church. And the universal reach of God's call to faith in Christ and baptism into his church seems to deny the abiding covenant with the Jews. Prominent figures in the church from popes on down insist first on one, then on the other, to the alternate consternation and dismay of those concerned, especially with one or the other. Thus, the problem of doctrinal coherence in this area that is posed for Catholics after the council. Gavin attends closely to it in the present book especially in chapter two and from a different angle in chapter five. For a Catholic recognizing in both doctrines authentic teaching given to the church by God, the question cannot be for a Catholic whether the two teachings cohere. It can only be how they cohere. As Gavin shows, however, this is not easy to say. Inability to offer a convincing explanation, in the first place, a convincing explanation to ourselves as Catholics of how our doctrines fit together is a grave problem. Despite our readiness to congratulate ourselves on our tolerance for ambiguity, our embrace of paradox and so forth, the human mind loathes contradiction and flees it. At best, it takes great and continuing effort to hold on to beliefs of whose opposition we have become clearly aware, even when we also believe, as in the present case, that the two can in fact be reconciled even if we do not presently know how. Our normal course, when confronted by beliefs of whose opposition we are clearly aware, is simply to ignore one of the conflicting beliefs generally without admitting to ourselves that we are doing this. Most Catholic writing on the Jews and Judaism since Vatican II follows just this urge to flee contradiction. With the church's consistent teaching on the absolute universality of her own divine mission, usually the doctrine that is allowed to disappear into the outer darkness. Gavin to his great credit, confronts this matter head on. To this problem, this problem of the basic coherence of Catholic teaching, Gavin offers, if I read him correctly, two distinct solutions. One of these turns on the notion of the permissive will of God. This approach, while suggestive and thought provoking, is I think unconvincing. The other solution turns on the reality of Hebrew Catholics as distinguished from Messianic Jews. That is the reality of a small community of Jews fully converted to Catholicism by faith in Christ, baptism and Eucharistic life, who continue to engage in traditional Jewish practices and enable them in their own self understanding to be recognized as Jews within the Catholic church. Here, I think Gavin offers a genuine solution to the doctrinal problem, an account of the coherence of Catholic teaching on the unrevoked covenant with the Jewish people and the universal mission of the church. Serious difficulties remain, but they are of a practical rather than of a logical, conceptual and doctrinal kind. Catholic teaching seems to say that God wills two incompatible things. 
This is the core of the doctrinal conflict emerging in the wake of Vatican II. God wills that every human being enter the visible communion of the Catholic Church by faith in, and baptism, while granting that for reasons beyond their control and thus through no fault of their own without sin, many do not in fact do this. God also wills that the Jewish people remain in unrevoked covenant with him forever. To that end, God wills that they keep the Torah, and so it appears that they remain always outside the Catholic Church. That's the conflict of doctrine. Toward the end of his second chapter, Gavin argues that this conflict can be diffused by seeing here not two wills, or more precisely, two willings, of God that would, as such, enter into opposition with each other, but one willing and one permission. The willing, or as Gavin puts it, positive will is that every human being enter the Catholic Church. The permission or permissive will is that the Jewish people keep the Torah, which almost always means remaining outside the Catholic Church and often in sharp opposition to it though this can and does happen without fault on their part. Thus we have in this case, Gavin seems to argue, a positive divine willing and a mere divine permission. And so there is no conflict at the heart of the divine will and no conflict of Catholic doctrine. The idea of divine permission or a permissive will brings up difficult questions about how to understand willing in God but it is in any case a standard idea in Catholic theology, the idea of God's permissive will. I don't think though that this can be applied to the unre unrevoked covenant with the Jewish people now taught by the church. For this, there are basically two reasons. First, in the Bible, the election of Israel, God's establishment of his covenant with the Jewish people seems unmistakably to be a positive act rather than a mere permission. The Lord set his heart in love upon your fathers and chose their descendants after them, Deuteronomy 10. If this very covenant remains unrevoked, the covenant of which Deuteronomy 10 speaks, then it is as much a positive divine act of love now as it was at the call of Abraham or at the fort of the Jabba. Secondly, as typically understood, the notion of a permissive will is introduced in theology specifically to help understand the presence of evil in God's good creation. Everything good in creation is actively willed and given by God. Evil is not willed, but in some mysterious way permitted. Large questions loom here, of course, but since God's covenant with the Jewish people and their observance of it are obviously not evils, but great goods of salvation history, they cannot be understood as simply permitted by God, but rather they must be understood as directly willed by God. So the apparent conflict of divine willings remain. The conflict would go away, however, if traditional Jewish practice were possible within the Catholic Church. If it were possible within the Catholic Church in a way that clearly maintained both the unrevoked covenantal identity of Jews inside the church and their full embrace of Catholic liturgical and sacramental life, the life of the one church of Christ. This, Gavin argues, is not merely a possibility, but an actuality visible in the lives of Hebrew Catholics today. I think he's right about this claim, and it's of great importance that a Gentile Catholic makes this argument and that others join him in it. Even if there were, in fact, no Hebrew Catholics, the requirements of Catholic doctrine would be satisfied, and the conflict that Gavin and I both are concerned with would go away just in case the following two conditions obtain. First of all, the Jews are included in the church's mission in the name of Christ, which thereby remains truly universal, given that this mission must be carried out in the non-proselytizing way that Gavin describes in some detail in chapter five of the book. Second, any Jew who becomes a Catholic is fully able not required, but fully able to stand visible within the church as belonging to the people God set apart from the nations, and thereby bearing continual witness to God's unrevoked covenant with this people. 
On this second point, an argument Gavin makes in chapter one in some detail that the Mortifera tradition, that Jewish law, the law given to Moses, the so-called ceremonial law is now not only dead, but death dealing. This tradition does not express an actual requirement of Catholic doctrine. Gavin's argument on that point becomes particularly important at just this juncture. If correct, that argument shows, at least in principle, that traditional Jewish practices that are needed to maintain the distinct identity of the covenant people can exist within the church, together with full commitment to the church's sacramental life. Were there no Hebrew Catholics, this might seem like a purely imaginary, even fantastic scenario. The living Hebrew Catholics, some of whose writings Gavin discusses, have dared to live in a way that makes it real. If this is right, many questions naturally arise, but these are, as I suggested, of a practical rather than a doctrinal nature. Among the most important of these is whether Hebrew Catholics can reason, reasonably be expected to bear the tremendous weight this resolution of the church's apparent doctrinal conflict places upon them. They constitute an immeasurably small fraction of world Catholicism, visible only to those who expressly look for them. Their place within the church's overall understanding of her responsibility to the Jewish people today is at present unclear and in need of strenuous attention. Gavin de Costa has taken a long step in that direction, which is among the many reasons to welcome and be grateful for his most recent book. Thank you. Thank you so much. What I'd like to do at this point is to turn the microphone, so to speak, uh, back over to Gavin DaCosta himself and give him some opportunity to respond to these comments. Thank you very much indeed, all of the panelists. I'm honestly very moved at the trouble and care you've taken in, in posing difficult questions and ones that should be asked. Um, in trying to keep my response as short as possible so that we may have some further conversation. I'm quickly just going to go through each speaker rather than a kind of narrative uh, and make a few points. So, um, David, thank you. Uh, it's the kind of feeling like, you know, when you've finished writing a book and then people make comments and you think, oh, I wish I had sent it to him before I'd actually published it. Um, so I like, I like very much and accept your point about the term inclusive supersessionism rather than exclusivist supersession. And I also take very seriously your questioning as to whether soft supersessionism or inclusivist supersessionism can easily slip in to a harder form, especially when you've got um, 1.2 billion people in the audience as the Catholic Church has, and how on earth do you convey very subtle, sophisticated uh, differentiations like this in terms of transmission? So I, I take those points fully. I think uh, at the baseline, underneath those questions is the issue of lack. And you said you were uncomfortable with that and uh, I would be uncomfortable if someone told me my Catholicism lacked. I, I take the point. In terms of serious exchange between religions, though, I think uh, there's a kind of politics about what words we use, but essentially there is uh, a kind of incontrovertible set of issues between Jews and Catholics that would have to be addressed. And in the quote that Phil gave from uh, Pope Benedict is the question of who Jesus is, uh, the sense in which is he is, as claimed by the Catholic Church, the Jewish Messiah who is to come again, and the second person of the Trinity. So we do have certain sorts of beliefs that will create a kind of tension, uh, and I think in a way one can't get away from that, and that's one of the wonderful testimonies that you can still be talking to me after reading my book, which perhaps is quite, you know, difficult and even insulting in parts. And I, I take that seriously. The other point I want to just make is, um, interestingly, with David Novak and John Levinson, who actually 
kind of give me a bit of reassurance and say, look, you can't be a Catholic if you didn't think there was a lack. You know, what would be the reason that you would be a Catholic and why would anyone convert to it if that was the case? And I also think there's an important asymmetry here and that sets in a really serious problem. Uh, and that asymmetry won't go away. Whenever I talk to Muslims, they always quite rightly think uh, there's an inadequacy with my Trinitarianism and often see it as polytheism. And I have to say, sometimes I say things which make me wonder if it isn't. So it's, it's a difficult um, conceptual field. Now the point about the Jewish ceremonial law and Catholics legitimating forms of Judaism, absolutely agreed. This is uh, very incendiary and uncomfortable. And I think I'm just saying to fellow Catholics, once we've moved the terrain and we're not just affirming biblical Jews, but so-called rabbinical Judaism, we know we've got such a massive array within that umbrella. Am I affirming the type of rabbinical Judaism that uh, in minority but small, very vocal groups in Israel want to get rid of Christians from the land? And to say, let us destroy churches because they should not be on the land. Now, these are very small numbers, but I'm saying evaluatively at that point, I've got to say, well, is this what I see as an authentic development from biblical texts that we share? Now, I do take the point, uh, you don't want a Catholic trying to define a Jew when you guys and women are having enough controversy over it. But I'm saying it's a question I can't get away from. Uh, and in a sense, negotiating that question is really um, going to be delicate. But in a way, stepping back from it means we don't actually answer the questions that are pressing us. Um, point about sea change or Copernican revolution, you asked that very politely and delicately. Uh, am I sort of saying, um, what's the best metaphor? Uh, well, the reason I'm kind of concerned about this issue is that if the modern magisterium in Vatican II is contradicting the magisterium at Florence, why should we believe either if they are claiming to speak with authority? Now, this is not just, you know, a kind of polemical moment of my trying to defend the Catholic Church, which is pretty indefensible in all sorts of ways. I'm only trying to uh, defend it at one point and one point alone, formal magisterial teachings that teach authoritatively. Where are they if one wants to look at statements that say, uh, Jews are damned. Now, the point is Florence is the obvious example, and my whole attention to that is that the presuppositions of those at Florence assume that every Jew who remains a Jew after the preaching of the gospel is doing this, rejecting the truth knowingly. Vatican II, when it uses the word Jewish, has got a totally different kind of orbit. So, Rather than Copernican revolution, I would say the metaphor that best suits this is choppy ocean or forest thickets, i.e. two organic metaphors to express a church that's really struggling to move forward and think its way through. Ruth, I knew you would ask the most difficult question uh, connected with the whole issue of mission, and I'm totally grateful to you for doing so. And I'm, my, my response is going to simplify a lot of issues you raised. And I've broken it into two questions. And I love the metaphor because this is really about Habermas and how we talk to each other, the search for the ideal speech situation. You talk about how can, you, how can people talk if the larger team's motivation is conversion? And that's a really powerful and I think thoughtful metaphor because pretty well for the, uh, I would say almost until 1947, 48, there has been one team that has had social political power in the conversation and it has never been an ideal speech situation. And therefore, uh, 
the concern that you have, I take very seriously. But the other th metaphor that you give here is, are we doing dialogue for mutual understanding or probing the other for weaknesses to undermine their self-definition? And I would say that either or is not one I find myself in. And if I can just use, this is a very poor analogy, but it kind of means something to me. So my, my wife is a Quaker uh, and technically a Unitarian uh, in her beliefs, although she doesn't like that definition. So um, the question then is when I speak to my wife, do I have any desire to help her see, patronizing phrase, the truth of what the Trinity might mean as opposed to a Unitarian belief? Answer, yes, I do. Answer, 32 years I've failed with relentless consistency so that she has become even more convinced in what she holds. Now, question, do I love her the less? Answer, no, I love her the more because she helps show me when I'm talking rubbish or being totally unpersuasive. So I would prefer the metaphor of friendship to start off this question. When I am in friendship talking to a Jewish person, do I seek mutual understanding or am I trying to undermine them? I seek mutual understanding while being a witness to a truth that I want to be interrogated about. Uh, so I'm uncomfortable about that. Now, the one issue about the guidelines of uh, 1974 is about the self-definition. Ruth, I take totally seriously the Jewish community's definition and your own, which you put so clearly to point out that Messianic Jews, Hebrew Catholics are apostates. They are Jews at one level, but this is just not going to cut the ice. Agreed. My argument is not that Jews need to accept this. I don't mean this unrespectfully. I simply mean from the viewpoint of the Catholic Church thinking its own traditions, returning to the New Testament, discovering that actually Jesus was a Hebrew Catholic. I know he didn't call himself a Catholic, but technically from uh, my viewpoint, Mary, Joseph, the apostles, they were all Hebrew Catholics. So in terms of taking seriously the self-definition, while I take seriously the Jewish self-definition, I need to take seriously the self-definition of these people who find themselves in a situation where the two identities are seen as, uh, yes, we can live with them. And I know that will create difficulties and I appreciate the difficulties won't go away easily. But I think there's a kind of mutual internal conversation as well as an external conversation when we have dialogue. So I hope that it doesn't shift. It takes the points you're making. With Philip, I don't think I'm going to be able to address all three. I would only say that um, I do take Nostra Aetate's doctrine. My concern was that it is read not in company with Lumen Gentium 16. And I would make the bold claim that one misinterprets Nostra Aetate if you don't read Lumen Gentium 16, well, actually 14 to 16, before doing so. Um, but yes, it's doctrine. And uh, when I cited Morali, I didn't mean to agree with her, although I admit I did in my first book and carrying on my research made me think, nope, I don't, I don't think the argument is there, but okay. So I, I, that's a very inter, intra-Catholic conversation, but thank you for raising it. Would I agree where you are going, Philip, as uh, keeping with the guide ropes? In your lovely phrase, Christians as co-covenanting companions with Jews, both deeply engaging with the word of God. Answer, yeah, fabulous. I totally subscribe to that way of putting it. But I don't subscribe, you would <laughs> be surprised to know, with all the implications that you bring to that. Uh, in effect, I see what you are doing as a form of kind of Ranarian anonymous Christianity. I mean, you do say that this form of 
God's presence is Trinitarian and Christological, and you say that with respect to Jews. You don't, you know, you realize this is not the way they're going to read it, but if you're using the word God, that's how it is. But what it doesn't do, which is where I would then part company, is that it doesn't bring out the question of fulfillment properly understood, and this is going back to David's early point, which doesn't eradicate the Jewish covenant. Is there something that you want to say about Jesus as Messiah, which would be a question, not a oppression, not a threat, so that between Jews and Catholics, as Pope Benedict did with Neusner's book, finding it the most thrilling book because it was just coming out clear with this challenge. So without facing these questions, in my view, the process of discussion becomes uh, watered down. I mean, you know, we, we've got a lot of uh, material and especially from the Catholic side, uh, repenting to do, but the pertinent issues of what is distinctly claimed in the Catholic tradition won't go away. So I'm not comfortable entirely with the way you then develop your theme, but I'm totally with you on a lot of it. Final point, and this really goes back to Ruth's issue about mission. Uh, okay, so I don't do mission, I do witness. And I couldn't be who I am if I'm not witnessing. And I'm a pretty lousy witness, witness my wife, who has uh, proven that I'm totally ineffective as an evangelist, uh, whatever that means. But the important part about witness is that there is in humility without coercion, a testimony to something that is gripped the Catholic vision, a Trinitarian God, with Jesus as the second person. That isn't the whole game of it, but those issues have to be at the center of the conversation. Okay, with Bruce, um, okay, Bruce, I, I, re I really do wish I had, I think I did send my book to you <laughs> before it was published, but you didn't get the chance to comment on it. And now I'm really pulling out my hair. So I just say, I haven't got much hair, but the, the little bit I have. So on permissive will, uh, I'm in the wrong. Totally bad choice, bad move on my part, I agree. So the second edition, if it ever gets to that, and at the present cost, it will hardly even sell out of the first edition, but uh, OUP are offering some uh, cheap uh, uh, discount on the book. So the, the point I'd want to address, Bruce, is the second objection, which is that uh, forgetting or putting aside my, I think I would want to re, uh, I, I would want to not use permissive will because it actually buys into a number of negative echoes which are definitely not permissible. So uh, thank you. On the point about the weight put on Hebrew Catholics in my solution, uh, I would go further and say, this is so fragile, you must be nuts, Gavin. Okay, so this is a, a, a kind of conceptual insight that arises. But I also want to say that as with the incarnation, this kind of horrific, crazy scandal of one person being claimed to be who he is, you know, what reasonable person would believe that? Answer 1.2 billion Catholics and a number of billion Christians. So the solution that I'm suggesting about Hebrew Catholics providing a witness that Jewish rights are not extinguished, Jewish identity is not extinguished, is so new and early. And actually the Roman Catholic Church hasn't taken it on itself, except in 2015, where it talks about the Church of the Circumcision and the Church of the Gentiles being not only a quantitative definition of the church, but a qualitative definition. Now, where on earth can you find the precedent for that? And in Philip Cunningham's brilliant piece that 
goes through every statement and gift showing where the background is, Philip couldn't find anything to show a precedent with this particular statement. So I'm gonna suggest that we are on the verge of yet another of the dominoes falling. Because once you start the first one, a whole series begin to fall in different patterns and directions and mine's very tentative. Okay, I think I better stop to make sure we can get some other conversation in, but I do want to thank my panelists and I know my response is very inadequate. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let me say that we do have a few moments remaining for questions from our participants. I will just apologize ahead of time because um, today we have 330 participants in our webinar and I know that we won't get to everyone's questions. Um, you can feel free though to go ahead and add those and we will see what we can do. Um, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna begin with a question that was offered early neuralgic though it may be I mean, what are we doing today if we're not grasping the nettle you know um uh obviously many central issues about identity limits and boundaries of identity etc that's where uh, uh gavin's own comments just ended um and so one of our participants has raised a question about um it would be directed actually to um ruth langer the question about um, whether or not um, those who, I think you described it as a uh, hold in a sense, um, Jewish practice, a, a Jewish identity inside of a, of a Christian identity. And um, you, I think helpfully put your finger on the um, sharp edge <laughs> is raised there say perhaps in obedience to the first commandment, um, we might say. Um, the question, the questioner asks, I apologize because I'm scrolling through now dozens of questions that are appearing trying to find the question. The question is this though, is it the case that already in the broad community of Judaism, there are um, seriously varying expressions and accounts of Jewish identity. And for example, we could look at um, humanistic accounts of Judaism. Um, and I will rephrase this way. If we, you know, if we allow in some of those accounts, even, even, even described within the community by some as um, less than ideal expressions of identity, could we also allow in some of those who have become the focus of this conversation in the end. Yeah, so I can reiterate what I, what I said before, and I was trying to be, to thread the needle on a complicated set of, of topics on this uh, and, and not offend people, uh, is that for somebody who is born to traditionally a Jewish mother, today in the reform war, in the liberal end of the Jewish spectrum to a Jewish parent, Judaism is a matter of birth. And so that Judaism is a, is, can be expressed in, in a myriad of different ways, but sociologically and theologically, the boundary becomes uh, when one becomes a member of another religious community. So that's not a that's not a, a legal definition. Legally, that person is indelibly Jewish, but in terms of the communal definition, there are certain markers of belonging to other communities, and that then uh, is 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 saying that I what I what I was trying to say that was somewhat new and requires some discussion is that it's we need to also learn how to respect a decision to belong to a different religious community in our world. Uh, that's where I think the, that, that's the self-critical voice in that particularly uh, is that, that, and that also then needs to go both ways, but that there is no test of faith within the Jewish community other than a sort of negative test, which is ascribing to the creed of something which is other than Judaism. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, I'll direct a, a question specifically to um, Bruce Marshall. This is coming from Adam Gregerman. Um, Bruce, could you say more about how it is that Hebrew Catholics helped to resolve the tension you named concerning Hebrew non-Catholics, Jews? It seems uh, like the range of the resolution you lay out is limited without addressing Jews, especially without evaluating the status or the legitimacy of the Hebrew side of um, Hebrew Christians. What, did it, what is it that they share with Jews? So another question, a related question about identity. Yeah, so the question I was concerned about, which um, I think Catholics have not been uh, adequately attentive to, um, and I think, in fact, have not unfortunately, uh, often not been entirely honest with um, our Jewish interlocutors and dialogue partners about um, is the uh, difficulty of holding together two Catholic doctrines, um, which, as I tried to explain briefly, seem incompatible. So I think that the um, the insight that Gavin has, which he took a while for me to come to see, um, I was initially unconvinced. Um, but uh, the insight that he has is that what is essentially happening within a Catholic self-understanding, uh, even now as we speak, even in light, say, of some particular passages in gifts, um, is a Catholic recognition of a possibility of living a recognizably Jewish life within the Catholic Church. Uh, I think Gavin is, is profoundly right that that is, um, that is a dramatic and at this point it's still very fragile and uh, nascent development, embryonic uh, development. Uh, but those, it, those conditions have to be met if Catholic doctrine is finally to be self-coherent uh, or self-consistent. Um, so how, who decides um, whether a, um, a person who claims to be a Hebrew Catholic really is a Hebrew uh, in the sense in which it's meant, that is to say someone who's recognizable as a Jew within Catholicism. Um, and here, you know, the, the comments that, that Ruth made and that, that Gavin made in part in response to her, I think are, are just very important and I think everyone all the panelists uh, have touched on this in some way or another, that itself is a contested matter, right? I mean, Jews have a different understanding of Catholicism than Catholics have uh, of Catholicism, right? Um, Catholic worship is traditionally viewed, even if not um, so much in, in modern Judaism, but Catholic worship is traditionally viewed in Judaism as idolatry, okay? as a false worship of what is our... Um, Catholics don't see their worship that way, okay? So the question of um, how Jews can live recognizably as Jews within the Catholic Church is itself likely to be a matter um, on which uh, Jews and Catholics will disagree. And as Gavin said, um, he, you know, he understands, I, I understand that a Hebrew Catholic, and we're talking about, you know, people that some of us know and love, I mean, this is, becomes very intensely uh, human and personal, um, will be regarded as an apostate by the Jewish community. Um, so ongoing conversation, co-covenantal conversation, to use Phil's, uh, Phil's terminology, um, is going to have to be part of this, but at the same time, um, it's likely to be an area where Catholics and Jews will disagree as they disagree on other matters. Okay, great. Um, and maybe I could direct this question to, uh, to Gavin, to you yourself. Other people may have thoughts. Um, one of our participants, Raymond Gannon, has noted the precedent that we have in Augustine's thought of a certain, um, a certain relatively positive account given of ongoing uh, Jewish practice um, as essential, obviously um, very important in the medieval world. Um, 
he suggests therefore that um the a commitment to ongoing embrace of Jewish cultural practice is not really a new idea. Could you say something more about what might be new here, if anything? Mm. Thank, thank you, Holly. Um, in, in one respect, Augustine's uh, positivity was also tied up with having a kind of universal witness because of the dispersion of the Jews to Christian truth. Yes. <laughs> now, what is new here and is absolutely distinct from the previous tradition is the argument that the Jewish existence is a gift from God, which is irrevocable and not just there to serve as a poster or a pointer to Christianity. So that rabbinic Judaism, and this goes back to David's point, actually poses deep and difficult questions for Catholics, because here I am told doctrinally by my church, I will see the activity of the true and living God. And there, and that means I need to learn. Augustine wasn't that interested in learning. He was interested in those rituals serving as a witness to the truth of Christianity. And I think today we have this if you like, double movement going on, the recognition that there is something to be learned. And I don't know what that is, that's gonna be something as part of the um, pilgrimage of the church, but it has to be done hand in hand with also holding to, if you like, a renewed thinking through of Augustine. And I think I, I point out in the gifts very interestingly, it says the supersessionist tradition, which reaches its high point in the medieval period, is to be rejected. Now that's actually a Catholic official document saying, wow, Augustine and Aquinas have got it wrong. Not explicitly, but yeah, okay, so they have. And this goes back to the whole idea of what is discontinuous and continuous. And I'm uh, pleased to say that that is a new element that's appearing in the tradition. I think that answers what you mm -hmm. raised, Holly. I hope it does. Mm -hmm. I think it does. Um, looking over the questions um, <clears throat> as a whole, I'm going to um, open the door to um, an entirely different question, although I don't think it's foreign to your book. Um, so again, I think um, Gavin, I'll direct this question to you. Um, uh, Gerald McDermott wants to ask what uh, we've not we've not touched on it at all. But what um, some of the implications of this conversation might be for um, considering the land Israel. Um, and maybe you could just suggest we have a short time, you know, maybe you could just begin to lay out. Um, obviously, that is not a topic that has received the same kinds of attention as temple, Torah, etc. But um, where you think, you know, sketched out for us what might be uh, next there. Yeah, well, it, it struck me that every time uh, serious Jewish thinkers respond to Vatican documents, including the gifts, they always bring up the fact that the Catholic Church never addresses this question that is absolutely vital for Jewish existence. And I mean that in every sense. And I think that in a way the Catholic Church has backed off from that question because of its commitment to the Palestinians, because of its commitment to the Middle Eastern church communities, because of its relationship with Islam. Those are three big factors. But really, if we are going to get mature about this conversation, the land has to be addressed. There are three types of position in Catholic thinking. One is the land promises are all subsumed in Christ. After Christ comes, the land is invalid. I've rejected that. The second position is actually a diplomatic recognition of Israel's right to exist, but not a theological underwriting of that. And uh, Phil has got a fantastic volume. I think Ruth and Phil, isn't it? You, you've got a new volume on this matter. Um, 
And this is a kind of position that's very positive, but doesn't, oh, there you go. I need to get some of the, um, <laughs> uh, some of the money from that book now, Ruth. Uh, this kind of position is, I think, where the Catholic Church is safely. My position is to argue that there is a theological question here. We can just say no, it has no theological significance and come clean. Disappoint people, maybe, but that's life and that's what, you know, conversation is about. But to me, there is enough resource to say a very careful, qualified yes, what I call minimalist Zionism which argues there is a theological promise in a very murky way being expressed in history. And Ruth brings in history, not just Israel. And that can never cut across the Palestinian question about justice and peace, but it shouldn't stop in my view, the Catholic church thinking its way through. And I would also say this will never get public airing within the Catholic church until it's safe to come out. And when will it be safe to come out? Answer never, because this has been an ongoing problem. So I don't think if we just keep quiet about this, it's helpful. Uh, you know, all questions are unsettling and this one is the most unsettling. Um, so my feeling is watch this space in a 50 to 100 years time, there will be development on it because you got to give an answer to people who are in good faith saying, what are you Catholics thinking about this? So I'm disappointed that this wasn't brought up, but it's interesting to me that four American respondents didn't bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, on that note, so we've got at least 150 or perhaps 200 years of work that needs to be done here or and um, just wait or something. Um, but in any case, lots of good work to be done. I just wanna um, say again here at, at the conclusion of our meeting, uh, thank you especially to Gavin for the work that this book represents. It's really a gift to those of us who are trying to think through these issues. Thank you again to four respondents who took uh, time and energy to do this. And thank you to all of you who have um, joined us today. Um, I want to let you know uh, two things quickly. One is that you can uh, now, if you would like, use the question and answer feature to leave us an email address and we would be happy to add you to our list so that you'll be apprised of future events sponsored by our society. And um, I want to let you know that it, precisely given the level of interest that we have seen, the committee has now made a decision that we will sponsor for the first time a meeting that will take place mid-year. So not um, next November, but in the spring. That, that mid-year um, meeting, which will again be in webinar format, will take place on May 30th of the coming year. Um, the title, you'll see connects immediately to our own conversation is um, what is supersessionism a conversation with Rabbi David Novak you can also um, follow Facebook announcements um, to get more information on that and I'm also um, sort of amazed to report that Gavin DaCosta has suggested that he is available to um, respond to additional questions for which we just did not have time here and I can report that if you will search uh, for his name, you'll come quickly upon his professional email address at the university, and he is willing to hear from you there if you would like to follow up. Um, so thank you again to all and more to come. <laughs>